a story for you tonight. You want to hear a story? Yeah? Okay. All right. I want to tell you a story about a man, a young man named Justin. Um, not Justin Bieber, okay? So just get that out of your head, okay? <laughs> okay. Justin is a good guy, though. He grew up in the church, and he accepted Christ as his Savior when he was just 12 years old. And ever since then, he's done his very best to follow God um, and to follow Christ's ways for him. Justin is also a very talented musician. For as long as he can remember, he's loved singing and playing the guitar. The first time that he played with the church youth band, it was as though he had discovered what God had created him to do. There was something almost magical about using his gifts for God. And it was just so right, you know? Well, one time, Justin even had a vision about his playing. He was standing on stage playing and singing, and thousands of people were worshiping along with him. And then some began to make their way to the stage, giving their hearts to Christ as he sang and as he played. In his vision, he could almost feel the warm tears streaming down his face as he played. Justin believed that this was a vision for God, that it was a glimpse into the future that God had planned for him. He didn't tell anyone about it, but he committed himself to practicing and doing everything it took to accomplish what God was calling him to do. He went on to study music at a Christian college, and he played with local bands whenever he got a chance. He was also a part of this church's worship team. After college, he auditioned for many of the Christian bands that were based in the area. They all seemed to like it, but for one reason or another, it just never worked out. Justin ended up taking a job at a restaurant in order to pay his bills. Years passed, but no doors opened for Justin in the Christian music industry. And he felt like God had forgotten him. Or maybe he had misunderstood God's vision for his life. Justin thought he was living in limbo. He was tired of waiting. And he hated working in that restaurant. And then one day he got a call from an old friend from high school. His friend was touring with a popular band based out of California. And they needed a guitarist. And he said Justin was perfect for the job. His old friend assured him that he would love it. He said they were having a blast on the tour, partying at every location, and lots of money coming in. Best of all, this was Justin's chance to be a professional musician. Maybe it would even provide him with the money and the experience he needed to make it on his own. Waiting for God's promises can be difficult, can't it? It seems to me that we are all faced with situations and decisions like this sometime in our lives when we have to choose between waiting on God's promises or making our own way. And tonight's scripture presents us another story like that. Remember that we were talking about Abram and Sarai and God's promises for them. So we're going to pick up in chapter 16. If you didn't bring your Bible and you want to follow along, there are some at the desk in the back that you're welcome to borrow. Chapter 16 picks up after God has confirmed the covenant with Abram. And we see in the very first verse what's transpired. It says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him. Let's stop right there for a minute. We've been waiting for God's promise. God has even come and joined in a covenant with them, saying that, that their descendants will be as numerous as the stars. And yet here in verse 1 we see Sarai had not been able to bear children. Sometimes waiting is really hard. It says, but she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, the Lord has prevented me from having children. 
go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abram agreed with Sarai's proposal. So Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abram as a wife. This happened 10 years after Abram had settled in the land of Canaan. 10 years they've been waiting. And I want to tell you that in those days when a woman couldn't have a child, it was customary for her to give her servant to her husband so that he might have an heir for both of them through that servant. And actually the child that was produced would be considered the woman's child as well. And so it's not even that it's some, um, you know, crazy thing that this happened. This is in keeping with the customs of the day. But it's not what was promised, is it? And I think it's funny that this is what, this is what Sarai came up with as a way to solve the problem. Because the problem is that the promise has not yet been fulfilled. And Abram goes along with it. The result is then that the servant Hagar is pregnant. And then the scripture goes on to tell us that Hagar treated Sarai with contempt because she was able to get pregnant when Sarai wasn't. She was rubbing it in, right? And look at Sarai's response in verse 5, will you? It says, Then Sarai said to Abram, This is all your fault. I put my servant into your arms, but now that she's pregnant, she treats me with contempt. The Lord will show whose wrong you are me. Do you ever notice how when we make the wrong choice, our tendency is to blame someone else? <laughs> when have we heard that before? That woman you put here in the garden with me. You remember that? <laughs> yeah. So all of a sudden, Sarai is blaming Abram because it didn't go so well. And then her jealousy causes her to treat Hagar badly. Verse 6, Abram replied, Look, she is your servant, so deal with her as you see fit. Then Sarai treated Hagar so harshly that she finally ran away. Sarai's jealousy caused the pregnant Hagar to run away. But God didn't let her get very far. Verse 7, The angel of the Lord found Hagar beside a spring of water in the wilderness along the road to Shur. The angel said to her, Hagar, Sarai's servant, where have you come from and where are you going? Does that remind you of God walking in the Garden of Eden? Where are you going? Where are you? Do you think God knew? He, of course he did. But she answers, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she replied. <clears throat> the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her authority. And then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. And the angel also said, you are now pregnant and will give birth to a son. And you are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears. For the Lord has heard your cry of distress. This son of yours will be a wild man, as untamed as a wild donkey. He will raise his fist against everyone, and everyone will be against him. Yes, he will live in open hostility against all his relatives. Thereafter, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, you are the God who sees me. Hagar must have felt forgotten, do you think? She didn't ask for the child that she was carrying. And she didn't ask to be mistreated. But God sent an angel to tell her that she had to go back. You know, sometimes when we run away from our problems, they have a tendency to get worse. Have you noticed? And so I kind of like that God told her to go back. Because running away is not the answer. Instead, we need to turn to God in the midst of our problems and help ask him to help us respond in godly ways. And this is what I love about this conversation that happens. Because Sarai felt all alone. And then all of a sudden, she became aware that she was not alone. That the God who created the universe, the God of Abram, was there. The God who sees me. And you know what that tells me? God cares about the outsider. She wasn't his chosen one. Her son 
wouldn't be his children. But God spoke to her. He saw her tears and heard her cries. And he gave her a promise too, right? Your descendants will be as numerous as the stars of Israel. I'm not sure how great a blessing that was to know that you would have so many, but that your son would be as wild as a donkey, okay? But there it is, right? Yeah? Sometimes God doesn't respond the way that we expect him to, right? But indeed, Ishmael would go on to be the father of the Arab nation. And he would be as wild as a wild donkey. But Hagar took comfort, maybe not so much in what would happen to your son, but just in knowing that there is a God who sees her. A God who counts our tears and knows our hearts. And so she returns to Abram and Sarai. Verse 15 says, So Hagar gave Abram a son, and Abram named him Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. At last, a son is born. Abram is 86, and he finally has an heir. But this is not the fulfillment of God's promise. This is not the son that was to come. Instead, he's like a cheap imitation of the real thing. As we read into the next chapter, we see that more years have passed. And Abram is 99 when God appears to him again. Now, God has not appeared to Abram since he confirmed the covenant back in chapter 15, right? And here he is at 99. So Ishmael would have been 13. And God repeats his promise to Abram again. So if you have your Bibles, flip over to chapter 17, verse 7. It says, I will confirm my covenant with you and your descendants after you from generation to generation. This is the everlasting covenant. I will always be your God and the God of your descendants after you. I will always be your God. And I will give the entire land of Canaan where you now live as a foreigner to you and your descendants. It will be their possession and I, forever and I will be their God. You see, God is confirming again his covenant with Abram. And what this is is a sign that he is about to bring about what he promised in his way in his time. And then he gives Abram a responsibility of obedience, indicating his part of the covenant. And it's it's an act that his descendants would follow as well, confirming that they were God's people and he was their God. And God assures Abram again that Sarah will have a son. Look at verses 9 and 10. Then God said to Abram, your responsibility is to obey the terms of the covenant. You and your descendants will have this continual responsibility. That's not the verse I wanted. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's go to 17. Yeah, it's there. Oh, see, I wrote it down wrong. 15. Then God said to Abram, regarding Sarai, your wife. No, that's not it either. I'm sorry. <laughs> Lord, help me. I'm really distracted. He tells him again that Sarai will have a son. And in verse 17, it says, Abram bowed down to the ground, and he laughed to himself in disbelief. How could I become a father at the age of 100, he thought. And how can Sarah have a baby when she is 90 years old? So Abram said to God, may Ishmael live under your special blessing. You see, Abram still thinks Ishmael is the promised son. But God replies, no. Your wife, Sarai, will, have, will give birth to a son for you. You will name him Isaac, and I will confirm my covenant with him and his descendants as an everlasting covenant. Abram's 100 years old, and how many times has he been visited by God? And God has told him repeatedly, you and Sarai will have a son. And still he thinks that Ishmael is the fulfillment of that promise. And I love that he laughs. Because you know what that tells us? That's just crazy. That's just crazy. How can a 100-year-old and a 90-year-old have a son? Really, after everything you've been through, this is when you choose to laugh? Right. Because, like, it wasn't laughable when he was 86, I guess. I don't know. 
We're going to look at this chapter a little more next week. But here's what I want us to take away from this. Abram and Sarah got tired of waiting for God to fulfill his promise. And so they took matters into their own hands. And you see, their downfall is not just that he had a son with someone else. It's that they gave in to their doubts and their disbelief. And they looked for a way to carry out God's promise with their own efforts. Ishmael represents Abram's reliance upon the fruit of his own work, not God's. In their waiting, they began to doubt, and then they decided to act on their doubt. Even though they hadn't heard from God during that time, they were listening to their own human reasoning, waiting on God's promises when they just didn't. Sometimes in our waiting, we take matters into our own hands, don't we? Have you ever done that? Isaiah 55, 9 says, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher and my thoughts than your thoughts. And Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. See, why don't we get this, right? God says, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Don't rely on your own understanding. Rely on mine. And yet, how many times do we take matters into our own hands to bring about our own destiny? Isn't that what our culture tells us to do? Yeah, to make a way for yourself. But our faith calls on us for a persistence that goes against common sense. Trusting means that we believe that God can do what he has promised, even when it seems as ridiculous as an elderly couple having a baby. Abram and Sarai forgot that God, the same God who made the stars and called him outside to look at them, had the power to give life whenever and however he chose. Trusting means that we believe, even when it's hard to believe, Even when it's as hard to believe as a savior with the power to defeat death. It's kind of like what Nathan was saying. It's hard for us to believe that the cross is enough. Because we really think there's something we have to do to save ourselves. Don't we? One time Jesus was with his disciples. And he had just finished feeding 4,000 people with nothing but seven loaves of bread and a few fish. And after the people ate, the disciples went around and they collected all the scraps that were left and it filled up seven baskets from just those seven loaves. And if you're reading in that scripture in Mark, you go right from there to the next verse, the Pharisees are asking Jesus to give them a sign. (laughs) Give us a sign so that we might know. But Jesus says, your hearts are, your hearts are hard. Because you see, the sign was right there. They were just choosing not to look, look at it, right? But we don't really blame the Pharisees for not knowing, do we? Because they're the Pharisees, right? Because <laughs> they rarely get anything right. But then they go on from there, and the disciples forgot to bring enough food for themselves. And they still don't get it. They think that Jesus is upset. Because they didn't bring enough bread. Really? They think Jesus is upset because they didn't bring enough bread for everybody. (laughs) And Jesus looks at them and says, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? They had been walking with Christ as he performed miracles right in front of them. He had touched their lives and changed everything. And they're still worrying about whether they have enough bread. Don't you understand? Be not on your own understanding. You see, sometimes in the waiting, it's hard for us to believe in a God who provides everything that we need. But faith requires that we trust. That we persist in believing a God that doesn't always make sense. Genesis 18, 14 says, Is anything too
too hard for the Lord? No. <laughs> no, the answer is no. At some point, though, we all have to answer that question for ourselves. And it is in the answer to that question, is anything too hard for the Lord, that our true faith is revealed. If we believe that some things are just too hard for God, then we fail to recognize him as Lord. If we believe that nothing is too hard for him, then we must be willing to show our trust in him and be willing to wait for his answers in his time, not ours. So many, thing, so many times I think it should be in my time. You know, but God, it's been three days. Really, Abram was 100, right? But I want an answer now. And if I don't see you working, then I'm going to assume you're busy, and I'm going to go and do it myself. But true faith says there is nothing too hard for the Lord. And he wants what is best for me. You see, there's, there's that trust that he wants what's best, that he knows what's best for me, and that he can do whatever it is he needs to do. They, those things go hand in hand. But just because he can do, do things doesn't mean that he will do things the way that we want. But he does things in accordance with his promise and with his will because he knows the outcome. God is able. In Matthew 19, 26, Jesus says, With God, all things are possible. This should be our belief, too. In the midst of our waiting, we tend to believe that God has let us down. And too often we look to our ways, our logic, and our understanding. We believe in our power, and we want to make our own future and our own way instead of relying on his, waiting on God's promises and be faithful. Fortunately for us, Abram's story didn't end with Ishmael. God's promise to Abram was unconditional. He promised that he would bring him the son. And it continued even in the wake of their disbelief and doubt. But look what it says all the way over in chapter 21. Let's look at verses 1 through 3. Genesis 21, verse 1. The Lord kept his word and did for Sarah exactly what he had promised. She became pregnant and she gave birth to a son for Abraham in his old age. This happened at just the time God said it would. And Abram named their son Isaac. When did it happen? At just the time God said it would. I love that. Verse 5 says, um, Abram was 100 years old when Isaac was born. And then verse 6, and Sarah declared, God has brought me laughter. And all who hear about this will laugh with me. And what that means is that her joy was uncontainable. She was so full. Can you imagine wanting nothing more than a child? And then when you are 90 years old, the miracle of a son. God has brought me laughter. He has brought me laughter. God kept his promise. Waiting on God's promises can be difficult. Who would have thought that Justin would turn down such an incredible opportunity? But he did. <laughs> he said that he prayed about going to California, but he never felt at peace about it. He still believed in the future that God had shown him, and he didn't want to do anything to jeopardize that. A few months later, Justin was practicing with the church praise band when a new singer stepped in to join them. Her name was Rebecca, and Justin was pretty sure that she was the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. She had a voice to match, too. 
Justin and Rebecca started dating. One day after he picked her up from a, for a date, she said, I have something I have to share with you. She said, last night I had the strangest dream. You and I were on a stage somewhere and thousands of people were worshiping with us. There were streams of people coming to the front to give their hearts to Christ. And there were streams of tears running down your face. Justin, she said, what do you think that means? I think that means that God's promises are worth waiting for, Justin said. God's promises are worth waiting for. Do you think so? Yeah. Band, would you come back up, please? Are you waiting on a promise from God? Are you clinging to God's promises 